thanks for coming. Uh, we um, really uh, went deep into the checkbook and uh, flew a <laughs> speaker out from Abari today. Um, and uh, Josh Lord is uh, a new postdoc, or actually has been there a year now at Mabari, and has been uh, working on uh, ocean acidification and intertidal effects. And just been talking to him that he's also um, interested in uh, looking at uh, deep sea corals and sponges. So those of you who are interested in that will have something to talk to him about as well. Um, he uh, received a, a BA at Colby College uh, in Maine and uh, an MS at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology uh, and worked on gumbu chitons up there, which is a, a dominant species in the intertidal area up there, so the shallow subtidal. Um, and then uh, received a PhD from the University of Connecticut, um, where he studied uh, oysters and biofouling. So he's bounced back and forth between the uh, two coasts and uh, worked on a, a number of different kinds of topics and is now uh, working on uh, issues that related to ocean acidification. So looking forward to your talk. All right, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna talk about some experiments that I've been working on looking at community level effects of ocean acidification and global warming and other climate factors. So. Kind of in the beginning of some of the climate change research, temperature was really the main focus, looking at how it affected shell growth and the physiology of a lot of different marine animals. But and then in the 90s and 2000s, it's really shifted towards looking at ocean acidification as well. First, just by adding hydrochloric acid to seawater to make it more acidic, but then kind of a more accurate approach using carbon dioxide. And this is where you get a lot of the well-known studies showing that things like these guys, the pteropods, with shells that are dissolving or having difficulty producing shells under acidified conditions, not even just future acidification levels, but current acidification levels in the Arctic. Then, more recently, there's been a focus on multiple stressors. So, either temperature, not just temperature, not just acidification, but both, as well as things like hypoxia. And then, even more recently, there's starting to be a bit of a focus on community level effects. So we know how a lot of these individual species are affected by climate change. But if you do an experiment just on, say, one life stage of one species, it makes it a little bit hard to try to extrapolate that to the community level. If we know how sea star larvae respond to ocean acidification, that's really useful. But it's kind of hard to make predictions about how that's going to affect the ecosystem and mussels and other organisms just based on one species. So this quote kind of exemplifies that, just saying that one of the biggest challenges, not just for ocean acidification research, but really for climate change research, is taking into account species interactions and looking at community level effects. So there were two main questions that we were hoping to address with this research project. One of them was just trying to figure out how climate change would affect species interactions. So we have a couple of the common species here. You have uh, mussels hidden underneath the barnacles here. So mussels and sea stars, for example, how would the interaction between them be affected by climate change versus just how would a sea star or one life stage of a sea star be affected by climate change? The other thing we're looking at is what effect that indirect effects had on the way that species respond to climate change. So a direct effect of climate change would be something like a sea star actually physically dying or being, lowering its reproductive levels or something like that because of acidification or because of changes in temperature. An indirect effect would be a decrease in muscle populations that makes it harder for sea stars to find food. They have to spend more energy foraging. And this is going to have kind of a cascading effect throughout the ecosystem. So these indirect effects, whether it's what I just described, inducible defenses, trait-mediated indirect interactions, all of these aren't really taken into account in many of the studies of climate change, kind of because we're just on the frontier of a lot of this stuff. We're just looking at how individual species are responding to these variables. So really, we're hoping to kind of take this to the next step and look at how some of these more complex interactions could be affected by climate variables. So one of the species that we definitely wanted to focus on were the mussels out here, because they're competitively dominant. 
they're not only dominant here on the Central California coast, but similar species of mussels are dominant on rocky intertidal coastlines pretty much around the world. And if they're the dominant competitor, then anything that affects them, either directly or indirectly, is going to be important as well. So the initial species that we were hoping to look at and see how its interactions with mussels were affected was the sea star, Pisaster ocracius here. But unfortunately, over the last four or five years, sea star wasting disease has really wiped out a lot of the sea star populations. Not just one species, but many of the different species, whether it's sunflower stars, Pycnopodia, like the one that you see here, or Pisaster, a lot of these sea stars that used to be really abundant, their populations have just crashed at many sites in Central California. Areas where you used to find many of these guys, you'll have to struggle to find one or two now. You can still find them in most places, but there's a couple problems. One, their densities are really low compared to what they used to be, so they're not nearly as ecologically important as they used to be, at least right now. But also, when they haven't developed symptoms yet, there's no way to know whether it has this sea star-associated densovirus or not. So from an experimental standpoint, this is a little bit tricky. When we first started to plan out these experiments, I figured, well, if I go to an area with a whole lot of sea stars, where there used to be a whole lot of sea stars, and find enough of them, mostly small ones because they haven't been affected yet, then I'll still be able to get enough and do some of these experiments. But after collecting about 50 of these small sea stars up near Bodega Bay, where there's quite a lot of them, within a couple weeks, most of them had died in the lab because they were just in this asymptomatic phase where they weren't yet displaying any of the symptoms of the sea star wasting disease. So if I want to do a long-term growth experiment, it's not ideal that one of the species is dying from an unrelated factor during the experiment. So to kind of fill the void ecologically and to fill the void in the experiment, we need to find another predator that can feed on the mussels here. One of the species that we kind of switched to sort of fortuitously was the line shore crab, Pachygrapsis crassipes, and that's this guy, which this photo is just down in Moss Landing. They're all over the place down here. You'll find them at the densities of hundreds per square meter. They're super abundant. And they're generally considered to be herbivorous because when you see them out in the intertidal zone, you see them doing what this guy's doing right here, which is just scraping microalgae off the rocks, or you'll see them pulling pieces of ulva, seaweed, out of the water and then eating those. And this is pretty much the only thing that you'll see them doing at low tide. They'll occasionally scavenge on something that's dead, but they aren't really known to be predators. But we had them in the lab for an unrelated experiment, and they ate a few of the juvenile mussels. So we thought, huh, let's kind of investigate this a little bit, go down this rabbit hole and see if these guys might actually be predators. So this, again, is just down here in Moss Landing Harbor, and just on top of the rocks, remembering that most of these guys are gonna be living underneath the rocks. Just on top of the rocks, there's actually 16 of them here. And most of them are either just sitting out on the rock, looking around, watching for predators, I suppose, or feeding on the microalgae that's on top of the rock, just kind of scraping it, looking around, and feeding. But this area has one of the ones that's over 100 per square meter, and they're really, really dense at a lot of different places along the California coast. So like I said, we wanted to see if they're actually going to eat mussels. So the first way that we wanted to test this was by actually putting it out in the, lab, in the field. So this is actually that same site. And we put 40 mussels on each of 36 of these experimental panels here. And we just let them attach in the lab so that they're all attached with their bissel threads and they're going to stay there. And then a third of these panels we left open like this where anything could just come by and eat them. A third of them just had a cage that went over the top, but the sides were open, so it prevented birds and otters and large crabs from getting in there, but the small crabs could still get in. And then a third of them had completely enclosed cages so that the crabs couldn't get in. The only thing that could get in would be little amphipods and things like that that aren't going to eat them. So we wanted to see what happened, and this is actually from a GoPro that I was brave enough to just leave out in the field for 24 hours, just sitting right next to the walkway there, but kind of hidden under some rocks. And we wanted to see what was going to happen in addition to just checking back on them. And what we found out is that the water's really murky in Moss Landing Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> but we can see here from this that's actually in a tank in the lab that they'll actually, we actually have a good video of them eating them. So this is a time-lapse video that's taken over about 10 minutes. And this crab actually eats five mussels over that period of time. <laughs> 
So you can see it's just crushing them, pulling them open, and then pulling all the tissue out. So like I said, this one ate five in about 10 minutes. This isn't, you can't necessarily extrapolate 10 minutes over you know, years, but it shows they can eat a lot of these. And this was the same thing that we saw in the field. So these were out for 24 hours. There were a total of 480 mussels on panels that either had the half cages or no cages. Out of these 480, three were left 24 hours later. All the other ones were gone. And despite that murky photo, there, were, there was enough visibility to see that the only thing that was in there eating them were these crabs. You see six or seven of them at once. Pretty much as soon as the water level rose over the panels, the crabs moved in. Presumably they're less vulnerable to things like um, birds, which could be eating them, picking them off at low tide. So once the water comes in, they can start going to town on these. So even though we see them eating a lot of the seaweed at low tide, it appears that they'll really eat these a lot at high tide, at least in protected areas like this. We did further follow-up experiments in the lab and found that they'll eat up to 50 juvenile mussels a day per crab. So when you're thinking about areas like this that have 100 crabs per square meter, then all of them can eat up to 50 of these mussels per day. You get a huge community level effect of these crabs, which are pretty much considered to be herbivorous, eating a lot of these mussels. And these mussels are really, we are using ones that are about 10 millimeters long. So these are a few months old. These are not new recruits. So imagine how many they could be eating when the mussels first start recruiting and they're just say a millimeter long, the crabs could have even more of an effect. So the bottom line is they are potential predators of the mussels, so we could use them in these community level experiments that we want to do in the lab. So this is the kind of experimental food web. I'll talk more about the actual methods that we used in a second. But the crab from our laboratory experience will eat mussels and juvenile abalone and whelks. So it'll eat all these guys. So it's the top predator in these small tanks that we used. The whelks will also consume mussels and the abalone were fed seaweed, which they like to eat when they're, when they're small. They're not eating kelp yet. So they're eating thin leafy seaweeds like ulva. So what we wanted to figure out is what effects climate change could have on this food web. So for one, a whole bunch of studies have looked at direct effects on mussels. So Things like bissel threads of mussels are generally weaker under acidified conditions. Their growth rates are slower. Their larvae are especially negatively impacted. But we weren't really looking at anything to do with the actual mussel direct responses. We're just looking at how they are being affected by predation from these guys. So if you think about what effects climate change could have here, if climate change, let's say warmer temperatures, if warmer temperatures increase the feeding of the crabs, then that would have a negative impact on the mussels. But it could also negatively impact the whelks, which then would have an indirect positive effect on the mussels. So that would complicate things. If you think about acidification, our prediction was that the most negatively affected species would be these three, the ones that have the calcareous skeletons. They have calcium carbonate skeletons. They need to get the carbonate out of the water. So it's harder for them under more acidic conditions. So that hypothesis with these, was that these guys would struggle to produce shell over the course of the experiment, and that the crabs would be relatively fine because they do not have primarily calcareous skeletons. So I'm not going to go through all this, but we measured a whole bunch of different aspects of feeding and growth in all the different species, especially the ones that were shelled here. So you can see these are the whelks, Nucella ostrina, which is pretty common out on the rocky shores here. And you can see that there's a hint of red around the edge of their shell, and that's actually nail polish. So we put nail polish on the edge of their shell so that we could see how much lateral growth they had over the course of the experiment, and it was a surprisingly large amount. But we also weighed them and measured them in a bunch of different ways before and after the experiment. And then we fed everything weekly. The abalone needed to be fed a little bit more often. We fed them every five days, and we measured the feeding for all these as well so that we could make sure that any effects that we were seeing weren't just, while well, they're eating less or something like that. So the, there were 64 of these tanks. So we needed a whole bunch of cages. And the typical way that I made cages for kind of ecological experiments like this in the past would be you get plastic containers, and then you cut holes in them, and then you glue mesh to the sides and all this so that it can get flow through. But 
when you're going to be making hundreds of them, that's a huge pain. And um, if it's a long-term experiment, you need to make sure that the cages are going to hold up over the whole experiment. So the cages for the abalone were actually tea infusers, plastic tea infusers. And for whelks, these are uh, fruit infusers, so something you put in a pitcher to let it taste like oranges or lemons or something like that. But they held the animals well. And so within each one of the experimental tanks, there was one abalone in a cage with its food in the cage. If there wasn't a cage here, the crab would not only eat the abalone, but eat the seaweed. So that wouldn't be really helpful. Then there was one of the whelks in the cage and mussels in the cage for it to eat. So this was just to look at whelks that were affected by the scent, potentially, from indirect effects or excretions from the crabs, but not directly exposed to crab predation. We wanted to make sure, since this was a growth experiment, that we could look at growth over the whole experiment for these guys. If they weren't in cages and they got eaten, that would make it difficult to do that. So we did want to incorporate a bit of a more direct effect. So we did have whelks that were free to roam around the cages as well, around the tanks as well. And they were feeding on the same muscle population that we put in there for the crabs to eat. Only half of the tanks had crabs. So the crabs, the presence or absence of crabs was one of the effects that we're looking at. And we also want to look at impacts of temperature and ocean acidification. So this is why we needed a whole bunch of tanks. And so we had 64 of these couple gallon tanks. And like I said, we had CO2 treatments, temperature treatments, and crab treatments. One of the things that we wanted to incorporate is not just two kind of static pH levels, but the naturally fluctuating pH. So we're using the same ambient seawater system that you guys have here. We, whatever you guys have left over shoots down to us at Ambari. So we get whatever's, whatever is going on in the water out in Monterey Bay that gets sucked in here is what's going to happen in the lab here. So it's not just a constant pH level. There's a whole lot of fluctuation. And we wanted to include that and do a, a pH offset instead of just a set pH level. So in the header tanks that were supplying water to all of the acidified treatments here, we had a pH sensor hooked up to a computer and a LabVIEW program that was providing feedback from a control tank and was always maintaining pH by pumping in more or less amount of CO2 to control the pH level in all the acidified treatments. So it was maintaining a 0.3 unit pH offset beneath whatever the incoming ambient was. If it was coming in at 8.2, it would set it to 7.9, and, and so on. For temperature, we want to raise it at about 2 degrees. Again, the reason we picked both of these 2 degrees and the 0.3 pH offset is because these types of changes are things that we see under upwelling conditions as well, even though you'll see a decrease in temperature with upwelling. And then we also didn't want these to be lethal effects. We're looking at sublethal effects on all these animals. Again, it doesn't do you any good to do a growth experiment if it's going to kill off the animals during the experiment. So, oh, so the temperature was modified with these heat exchangers. So for each one of the 64 tanks, there was about 25 feet of Tigon tubing going out to it. So I'm not sure what the actual numbers are, but we had over 1,000 feet of tubing that was going to all these different things. And so the tubing for the heated treatments basically coils through these coolers, which are being used as heat exchangers that had 2,000 watt aquarium heaters inside them to heat the water up and make sure that the water coming out was two degrees warmer than the control. So it did a really good job maintaining the temperature and the OA conditions that we wanted. The pH offset here on the bottom was very, very steady. Again, we wanted negative 0.3. That's close enough. And you can see, though, if you look at the top solid bar here, we had pH levels as low as 7.6 coming through the seawater system and as high as around 8. It usually lived right around 7.9 or so. But there's a lot of fluctuation. And the temperature fluctuated as well, as you would imagine. So depending on the wind conditions and upwelling conditions, you're going to get a lot of shifts actually in the seawater system. But both of these did a good job maintaining the offset that we were looking for over the course of the experiment. But this is something to kind of think about if you're doing a short-term experiment. If you were looking at, say, fertilization rates of sea urchins or something like that, just making things up, and you want to do a three-day experiment, if it happened to be over these three days, you might get drastically different results than 
over the three days at the start of the experiment, just based on natural fluctuations in the seawater system. You know, you generally think lab setting, it's pretty controlled, but that's really not the case here. So what we saw most strikingly was a really negative effect of acidification on the crabs. Over half of the crabs, 60% of the crabs died during the experiment in the OA treatments, and mortality was really low in the other treatments. So you can see mortality on the bottom here. The blue ones are the CO2 treatments, the so high CO2 treatments. And you can see they're 60 to 70% mortality. And when they died, we'd replace them because we're looking at chemical cues and effects on the other species. So this is over the course of the experiment. So they not only were dying off, but when they weren't dying, they were also feeding a whole lot less, feeding about 50% less over the course of the experiment. And this was pretty surprising. We weren't expecting to see a whole lot of an effect on the crabs of ocean acidification. So why is that? We were thinking there's a couple possibilities. One is that these crabs, and really all crabs, they actively maintain their internal pH. So they're pumping in bicarbonate ions to control their internal pH. So they might either be unable to maintain this acid-base equilibrium internally under acidified conditions, or they could just be spending so much energy actively pumping in bicarbonate ions under acidified conditions that it's taking a toll on them energetically. And this is indirectly leading to the, the death and reduced feeding that we see here. So there's a couple possibilities, but it's clear that this is a strong negative effect. And we're now starting to look and see if this is a more general response, not just Pachygraphsis, but some of the other crab species as well. Just as surprisingly, the whelks were completely unaffected by any of the environmental conditions. So these are the caged whelks over on the right. And so to take you through the diagram here a little bit, these are various factors of tissue growth, shell growth, and feeding. And across here, the first and third one are the high CO2 treatments. The second and fourth are the controls. The ones on the left are controls, and the ones on the right are heated. So it doesn't really matter for this one because none of those effects are significant. The caged whelks didn't reduce their feeding or change their growth rates when the crabs were there, and they didn't have any effect at all of acidification or temperature, which is pretty unusual. But when we looked at the uncaged whelks, they still had no effect at all from acidification and temperature, but a dramatic reduction in their feeding, and this is because of a behavioral avoidance. So the mussels are on the bottom of the tank, the crabs are on the bottom of the tank, and the snails, the whelks, in these treatments basically stayed on the sides and the lid of the tank the entire time. They hardly ever came down to feed. And that part of it's just anecdotal as far as where they are in the tanks, but you can see that their feeding was way lower, over a fourfold decrease in whelk feeding in the purple ones, which are when the crabs are there. Then a huge decrease in shell growth, huge decrease in tissue growth. So they really aren't doing much except hanging out on the side of the lid of the tank when the crabs are there. So this is a massive behavioral avoidance that has not been documented previously. And it's interesting because when they're avoiding the crabs, that means they're really, it's either means that they're going to be delaying all of their other, their growth and reproduction and all that, or they're just gonna be growing a lot slower in, in general in environments when the crabs are there because they're gonna be feeding a lot less. So remember I said that we put nail polish on the edge of the snails at the start of the experiment? You can see these are all the same individuals at the start and then at the end. So this is a period of 10 weeks. It's two and a half months. It's not that long considering these things live a few years. So in the lab, they can grow really, really quickly. So when we are seeing over the course of the experiment that these are growing a lot, this is going to be really good. If there are effects of acidification or of temperature, we're really going to see them here. But that wasn't the case. And there's a few possibilities for why the whelks weren't affected that much, but I'll get into those in a little bit. So this behavioral avoidance, this reduction in feeding, reduction in shell growth, reduction in tissue growth by the whelks when the crabs are there has some pretty wide ranging effects on the way that they're interacting with the mussels. So this is the percent reduction in whelk feeding. So when the crabs are there, this is as effective as a result of the crabs. The crabs are what is reducing the whelk feeding. So a consumptive effect is 
that basically the whelks are not going to be feeding anymore if the crab eats them. So 100% loss of feeding if it's been eaten. That's a direct consumptive effect of the crab on the whelk. It's an indirect effect on the mussel, but it's a consumptive direct effect on the whelk. The non-consumptive effects are the reduction in feeding and growth that happens because it's just sitting there not really doing anything. So it's not getting eaten, but it's dramatically reducing its feeding rate. So you can see that across all the treatments, the highest direct consumptive effect was a 50% mortality, which led to a 50% drop in feeding, which are the black bars here. But most of them were kind of in the 10 to 30% range. A significant, but not a huge effect. But the non-consumptive effects, these behavioral avoidance effects, were in the 70 to 95% reduction in feeding range. So huge indirect effects. And these non-consumptive effects are definitely in this system more important than the direct consumptive effects. And this is actually true in a few other systems as well. Basically, when things are afraid of being eaten, they're not going to go out and venture out as much. And this can affect all of the animals in the population. So an East Coast example would be with green crabs and the herbivorous snails that are out there, the litterine snails. Some of them are undergoing a 400% reduction in feeding in the presence of the crabs because they'll basically just sit in a crevice the whole time. So it's the same sort of deal here. But a presence of a crab or a whole high density of crabs in an ecosystem or a habitat, that can affect all the snails in the habitat. Whereas predation, even though it's obviously a really big effect for the ones that get eaten, it doesn't affect the ones that don't get eaten. So these non-consumptive effects are larger, having larger impacts on the community as a whole because they're affecting all of the animals, not just the ones that are being eaten. Another interesting element that kind of came out of this was that the mussel feeding rates, whether the crabs were there or the crabs weren't there, were pretty much the same. So this is the amount of mussel tissue that was eaten over the course of the experiment. And the bars that are white are the ones where there were no crabs. These are treatments without crabs. And so in these treatments, when the crabs weren't there, the whelks were eating about four grams of mussel tissue over the course of the experiment. When the crabs were added, the crabs, which are the gray bars here, ate a whole lot of muscle tissue, and the total amount consumed in those treatments was about four grams over the course of the experiment also. So when the crabs are there, you can see that these white bars drop from near four grams to down under one gram. So the dramatic reduction in whelk feeding in the presence of the crabs leads to basically no effect in the actual amount of muscle tissue that's being eaten, whether the crabs are there or not. But when the crabs are there, they are the dominant muscle predator. So when you go out on even the jetty or down near Point Joe or down in Monterey, when you're looking at these muscle-dominated areas, when you're talking about the juvenile muscles that we're experimenting with here, the main predator in the areas that have high crab density would be Pachygrapsis or some of the other crabs that are out there. Again, we're only looking at a subset of the species. But within this, this experimental food web, it would be Pachygrapsis, the crab. But if there are no pachygrapsis with acidification, you would still expect a similar amount of predation on those size classes of mussels, which is kind of an unexpected effect. But it's, again, due to these non-consumptive effects of the whelks on, um, or the crabs on the whelks. All right, so shifting gears a little bit to the abalone. The abalone had a little bit more of a predictable response. They, so we'll look at feeding first. There were no real effects of feeding except for the crabs. So these are still in cages. So just by kind of sensing the scent of the crabs, the abalone ate about 25% less. These are the purple bars here. Across all the treatments, they reduced their feeding. It's a substantial and significant effect, but possibly not ecologically or practically significant because this is only one life stage. They're not vulnerable to the crabs once they get larger. So it's, it's interesting, but um, not that notable in terms of their actual impact. They're not depleting the ulva populations or anything like that. If we look at shell growth, these are entirely different effects. No effect of the crabs on shell growth, no effect of temperature on shell growth, but a strong negative effect of acidification. So again, the high CO2 treatments are these two here, the first and the third one. And there's about a 40% reduction across all treatments in the shell produced over the course of the experiment for the abalone. So, this could be dissolution 
you can see before and after for this abalone and acidified treatment here. It could be dissolution. It could be a real difficulty in producing shell over the course of the experiment. Very few of them actually lost shell weight. So we think it's probably a combination of both. They're not just not growing at all. They're, they are adding a little bit of shell, but it's probably more expensive for them to add shell, and there might be some dissolution going on, judging by the looks of that as well. Then if you look at tissue growth, the main effect there is that they're growing a lot less, producing a lot less tissue when the crabs are there. So if there was no effect of crabs on shell growth and a huge effect of crabs on tissue, that means that there's an energy allocation shift within the abalone. So they can, as a juvenile, they're not allocating anything to reproduction. They're not reproducing yet. So their main costs, other than just maintenance, would be shell production, tissue production. If they're growing, it's going into one of those two um, groups. And they had a lot less tissue production and no change in shell production. So what you saw over the course of the experiment is a huge change in the shell to tissue ratio. So if it's positive, that means they're producing more shell than tissue. If it's negative, they're producing less shell than tissue. These are just relative numbers that you need to be concerned about, not the raw values. So what you see is in all the crab treatments, the purple bars, they have a much higher shell to tissue ratio over the course of the experiment. So they're allocating their energy to shell production. Even though they're eating a little bit less, which you saw here, they're putting a lot more energy into shell production, and this is at the expense of tissue production. So this indicates that these crabs are a significant predator, or at least crabs in general, are emitting a cue that is a significant threat to these guys. They know it's worth it. Well, you can debate whether they know it, but they can sense that it's worth it for them to be allocating um, their energy into shell production, which is theoretically going to increase their survival in the presence of crabs. So there's a few questions. I mentioned that we were going to come back to some of the whelk issues. The whelks did not have any response to changing temperature or acidification. Let's focus more on acidification. The whelks are exposed to a huge temperature range in the field. That's not necessarily something that, um, with the two degree change, we'd expect to see a big effect. So let's focus on the acidification. Why would the whelks not respond to acidification at all? At, at the surface, it really doesn't make a lot of sense because if you're just thinking about the chemistry of it, they are going to be producing calcite and aragonite shells. They need to be getting carbonate out of the water. There's less available, so it should be more difficult for them to produce shell. But they didn't show any effects, no change in feeding, no change in tissue growth, no change in shell growth. And one possibility is just that you saw how much shell they produced over the course of the experiment, there much, might just be a huge level of inherent variability in these populations that whether it's genetic or based on some other factor, their previous life experience, something could just be causing them to have a high level of variability. So some of them are going to grow an awful lot, some of them are going to grow a little bit, and this would, might just swamp out any acidification effects that we see, and that maybe if we did this experiment with 1,000 tanks instead of 60 tanks, 64 tanks, then maybe you see an effect that's just swamped out by the variability at this scale. That's possible. Um, it's also possible that there's genetic variability in their ability to respond to acidification. So maybe some of them are still able to somehow produce shell more easily under acidified conditions, and some of them aren't. And that's confounding this a little bit as well. It's possible, though, unlikely that they're shunting energy from something that's energy rich, like reproductive tissues, into, say, shell production. But we didn't see effects in their amount of tissue that they made over the course of the experiment. So that's probably not what's going on. It's also possible that they're just exposed to such stressful conditions in the field. The ones that are in tide pools are going to see huge pH swings. Ones that are living in more estuarine environments are going to see huge pH swings, big temperature swings. Wave exposure, like you see, this is the Oregon coast with a 100-foot wave spray there. Um, so they're exposed to some pretty nasty conditions, very um, widely varying conditions. So it's possible that over the course of a 10-week experiment, if you're just doing a little offset of temperature and pH, it's really not going to have that much effect just because they're exposed to such high levels of variability in the field. Another possibility that's 
entirely untested, but something that we're uh, testing right now is that these guys are drilling predators. So what they actually do when they're drilling is they produce an acidic material, uh, acidic substance, and they use this, a combination of that acid and uh, mechanical scraping with their radula to drill into the shells. And then they're basically swallowing this shell material. So either maybe it's less energetically expensive for them to produce the acid that they need to drill into the shells under acidified conditions, and this kind of balances out their energy budget, or maybe there's even something going on with the shell scrapings that they're taking. So if they're scraping through a muscle shell and actually ingesting the shell material, it's possible they can somehow use this to increase their internal um, saturation states of calcium carbonate and help them produce shell. But this is entirely untested, entirely theoretical, and so right now we're doing experiments with a bunch of different kinds of whelks and some of the whelks are drilling predators like this. Other ones are wedgers, which means they use their operculum to kind of wedge the shell open so they wouldn't have any of this. They wouldn't have need to produce acid. They wouldn't be drilling through the shell. And other ones are just scavengers and are just being fed shrimp, so they're not going to be drilling either. So it's possible if we see a huge effect of acidification on the other kinds of whelks, but no effect on the drilling ones, then maybe there's something to this. Otherwise, it's probably one of these top few factors here. So we want to then figure out how all of this could play out in the field. What effect is this little five species experiment? What is this going to tell us about actual communities in the field? So I'm going to show you a couple diagrams. And these are just contrasting the direct and the indirect effects of climate change. So the vast majority of climate change research to this point has pretty much looked at direct effects. So again, this is whether this is reduced shell production, reduced reproduction, reduced fertilization, direct mortality. All these are direct effects on the species from acidification or from temperature changes, the way that it's directly affecting a species. You can take one species at a time, do an experiment, and that's how you get the direct effect. The indirect effect will be taking into account things like inducible defenses, things like the behavioral avoidance that we talked about before. Any way that you could be shifting species interactions that you aren't getting just from single species experiments. So on these plots, we have indirect effects on the x-axis and direct effects on the y-axis. So if you have a species, let's say a barnacle or something like this, let's say a barnacle is for some reason positively affected by ocean acidification. Then you'd put it on the positive side or on the top here, a positive direct effect. This could be reproduction or growth or whatever. It's just a generic um, diagram here. So a positive direct effect. Then you go to the indirect effects. And let's say ocean acidification is really bad for the mussels. Mussels are competing with barnacles for space out in the field. So if it's bad for the competitors of the barnacles, this could be a positive indirect effect on barnacles as well. So in this case, you'd have a positive direct effect and a positive indirect effect. And this would mean that you could predict the species is really going to be doing well under climate con change conditions. But this could obviously go in a bunch of different ways. Some of the species like abalone are, had negative direct effects. Then the lack of crabs could be a positive indirect effect. So you have a bunch of different ways that this is going. So we wanted to quantify and make diagrams that look like this, but based on the actual results from our experiment, just to see what the diagrams would look like for our species. So looking at the whelks first, again, you have these same diagrams now. So direct effects on the x-axis and indirect effects. Oh, I guess they're switched from the previous one. But indirect effects here are on the uh, y-axis here. So the whelks. There, you can see these are the significant effects of acidification and warming. So there is really very little direct effects of climate change on the whelks that we saw in these experiments. However, the prediction based on our results would be that these whelks are going to be doing a whole lot better under acidification conditions because the crabs did so poorly. So in the absence of crabs, these whelks are going to be growing a lot more which means they're going to be reproducing more. They're going to be feeding a lot more, having much more of an ecological impact. So you can see the lack of crabs or the decline in crab populations could have a really large, high magnitude, positive effect 
indirect effect on the whelks. So in this case, if you average all three of these with the, the vectors here, what you get is a large positive response of the whelks to ocean acidification. Whereas if you just looked at direct effect, you'd say, nah, there's not really any effect. Maybe they'll do well because maybe some of their competitors aren't doing as well or something like that. But when you take into account the crab effect, you suddenly get a very strong response. So this means that if you were doing an experiment just on the whelks, you wouldn't really get a good sense of what's actually going to be going on in the field. Now, the abalone are a bit of a different story. So you can see, first of all, that the magnitude of everything is a lot lower here, especially the crab effect. So there would be a slight positive effect of the lack of crabs on the abalone. Remember, they did, um, they did cause the abalone to reduce their feeding a little bit, and they would consume the abalone, if they, but they don't really overlap that much in habitat out in the field. There's a whole bunch of predators on abalone that are not these guys. So there's not a really strong link between these two. So you get a pretty weak indirect effect from the crabs. The strongest impact on the abalone was the direct negative effect of ocean acidification. Remember, acidification caused a 40% reduction in shell growth in the abalone. So this is making them, first of all, it's, if it's, you're reducing their shell growth, you're reducing the how quickly they can grow overall, which means that you're going to be increasing the amount of time it takes them to get to reproductive size. You're going to increase the amount of time it takes them to get to a size refuge. And juvenile abalone are eaten by at least 14 different species. So even if you have a, a crab decline, even if all the species of crabs decline, then you're still going to get a bunch of different fish species and sea star species that are going to be having an easier time eating these guys because they're growing slower and because their shells are weaker. So the strongest effect on abalone that you see here from this diagram is the direct effect of acidification. So what you could conclude from this is that it would actually be a pretty good estimate of what these juvenile abalone are going to be seeing in the field if you were doing single species experiments with them in the lab. Now, it's important with all of these to focus on the most important interactions with these species. So when you're thinking about what kinds of indirect effects are going to be important and for which types of species indirect effects are going to be most important, the ones where they're going to be the most important are going to be species with, say, top-down control. So something like these purple sea urchins, that especially when you get up to like into the Oregon coast, their populations are controlled in large part by predation by the sunflower star, Pictopodia. So this is a strong interaction and can be top-down control in some ecosystem. So this would be a good candidate for looking at indirect effects. It would probably not be very um, accurate to just make a prediction based on how the urchins are going to be doing if you didn't take into account how one of their major strongly linked predators is going to be doing as well. You could say the same thing about fouling communities. They are strongly controlled by competition. If you go out to some of the docks up at where they rent the kayaks up there and lean off the side, you'll see that they're 100% covered in tunicates and bryozoans and other fouling species, space is a limiting factor there. If one species does a lot better, it's going to have a negative impact on the others and vice versa. So species that are interacting strongly with each other via competition are also going to be ones where it's really important to look at indirect effects. It'll be less important for species with bottom-up control. If, say, recruitment or nutrient levels or something like that is the main factor controlling how well they're going to be doing, then it could be really useful to just look at how they're going to be responding directly to acidification or temperature. And then also species like, in this case, the abalone, but um, you can think of many other examples where their populations really are not that dependent on how other species are doing. They don't have many strong links with other species. So you think of the rocky shore, you think something like pisaster and the mussels. That's a really strong link. That would be one you want to look at in direct effects. But if you pick some other species that doesn't really have any very strong either competitive or predator-prey links, then it could be really useful to just look at it kind of in isolation. So to just conclude some of the, if the effects that we saw here and the overall results from here, the crabs were surprisingly the ones that were most vulnerable to ocean acidification. The direct mortality for the abalone over the course of the experiment was zero, and for the whelks, one or two out of 128 whelks died over the course of the experiment, and there was no um, 
correlation between the treatments there. But like I said, 60% direct mortality from the crabs just from acidification. And this was a lot stronger than we were expecting and has some pretty big impacts, especially if this applies to other crab species beyond just the one that we were looking at here. Like I said, whelks had a pretty robust response. They didn't have any response to the environmental factors, and they did better when the crabs weren't there. And I mentioned that the level of predation on the mussels in terms of the amount of muscle tissue consumed probably wouldn't be that different whether the crabs are there or not, because when the crabs are there, they reduce the whelk feeding. But you could get a size shift in the muscle populations. These guys, these crabs, you see hidden away in the crack here, these were only able to consume mussels up to about 15 millimeters. So they're not consuming any of the larger ones. Whelks, especially the bigger ones, can eat mussels that are up to six and seven centimeters long. So you're getting a different size class that they're focusing on. So if the crabs are gone, then you might get higher survival with the new recruits, but lower survival with some of the intermediate size classes that the whelks are feeding on to a greater extent. And for the abalone, we mentioned that even though there could be fewer juvenile predators when the, if the crabs aren't doing well, they could be doing a lot more poorly overall because they just have so many predators if their shells are weaker and they're growing slower under acidified conditions. And I guess the bottom line takeaway message would just be that the species interactions drastically affected the outcomes. If we just looked at any one of these species, we would have much different conclusions than if we're looking at all of them in the context here of how they're interacting with each other. Now, we looked at five species. This is not by any extent um, the whole ecosystem out there. And we'll need to be, we're going to be doing different experiments with different sets of species that are strongly linked. But it does let us know that these indirect effects can be really, really important. And they've been largely overlooked in climate change studies to this point. So they're definitely worthy of study. So with that, I'll uh, take any questions. You can see one crab hiding in here. Yeah. Um, I really like those direct and direct uh, graphs, but I was curious for the, the effects of the crab. Um, yeah. Was that actually, was that an effect of the presence absence of the crab, or was that um, a, an effect of decreased crab feeding from the, of the acidification? So basically that, that huge positive effect on the whelks. Yeah. Is that just from the treatments where the crabs are totally gone, or is that from the acidification uh, treatments on the crab? Yeah, so this is, in this case, it's where the crabs are gone. And why we did that is because there were, I think, one or two crabs out of the 32 that we used that survived the whole experiment. We had to keep replacing the crabs because they had pretty high mortality. Um, the 60% mortality figure comes from the fact that some of the ones we replaced then didn't die over the course of the experiment. So anyway. The bottom line is we had really high crab mortality, and so if we're seeing that high mortality over 10 weeks, we'd expect the crab populations to be really low. So this, you're right, this is absolutely kind of a worst case crab scenario, but it's also, because we're looking at solely those no crab treatments, you're not taking into account um, other life stages of the crabs or anything else that could be experiencing further negative effects. So yeah, this is, basically the largest effect that you could see from not having the crabs, which especially highlights how the abalone really aren't responding to it. Um, so it's going to be much more important for the crabs and the abalone. Really, the main thing that we're hoping to take out, even though there are hard numbers behind these diagrams, these are all uh, percent changes in uh, cumulative index of growth and feeding and uh, growth and feeding in two different ways, so shell growth and tissue growth. Um, but the main thing that we're hoping to take away from this is just looking at the relative values. So you see the relative changes in all these different things. So if you look at whelks versus abalone, you say, wow, for whelks, the indirect effects are really important. For abalone, it's more the direct effects that are important. But that's a good point. Yeah. Well, my recollection is that for a lot of studies that look at crustaceans, that there tend to be pretty tolerant to changes in pH. So you think there's just something different about these intertidal yeah, um, so we have a couple of thoughts on that. And one of them is, so these guys are, they generally spend about half of their time out of the water. And for these experiments, they were in the water the whole time because we don't want them to be able to kind of control how much they're exposed to the experimental treatments. 
Um, but they were in the water the whole time for the controls and the acidification treatments, and so there was no difference across the treatments in that regard. But they could be able to mitigate their, um, in the field, they could be able to mitigate the effects of acidification by just not being in that water a whole lot. And so maybe they haven't evolved as much tolerance of acidified conditions as some of the other species that have to spend you know, almost all of their time underwater. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really baffling. A lot of them seem to die when they were trying to molt as well. So there could be some link that's kind of interfering with the molting success. So it's really not clear what the mechanism is, but it's, it's definitely one of the reasons that we're doing. So right now we're just starting up a similar experiment with green crabs and several species of whelks. And so green crabs are an interesting one because they're on both the East Coast where, so their, their history on, in Britain and <coughs> Europe and then the East Coast of the US is not a whole lot of exposure to acidified conditions. But being more recent invaders, relatively speaking, to the West Coast. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they respond. But yeah, we, we're starting to look at more crab species. If we, if we see a similar response from green crabs and some of the other intertidal crabs, then maybe it's an intertidal thing versus subtidal. And you could say, well, it looks like actually being physically out of the water for half of the time or something like that is having a positive effect on them, allowing to, them to avoid it. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure it could be something genetic if that's not the case. Yeah? I was wondering about the whelks with the reduced growth um, that are up on the sides of the cages. Yeah. So the food and the crabs are kind of necessarily in the same spot on the bottom. Um, in the field, is it possible that they'd be able to scurry away and still find muscles and much on? Um, ideally, yes. But Um, basically, the crabs in the field are in crevices. So the crabs are artificially contained to one part of the tank here. And in the field, the whelks are not going to be able to have the some, same sort of um, physical avoidance. They could. They probably would just have to hunker down in place and not move around as much. So in a lot of these tanks, when we would see the whelks in the bottom of the tank, in the same area where the crabs are, because they still had some feeding, when we would see them, they'd basically be clamped down tightly. And the crabs would be moving around there, and they rarely ate them. But it's either physical disturbance or just sensing that the crab is there. And that's causing them to kind of sit down, not eat as much, not move around as much. Um, so I think in the field, that's more likely what's actually going on. So instead of a, just moving away, that might be a convenient thing that they can do in the, in the um, lab. But in the field, it's more likely that they're just really going to reduce the amount of time that they're spending out trying to feed, physically trying to feed and moving around where they're more exposed because the crab just has to get a claw underneath. And, but it seems like when they're actually clamped down, not moving around, they, the crabs aren't able to get at them. So it looks like you might get a slightly different mechanism, but the same sort of result. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, we're really wanting to do some experiments of things that kind of span that range and pick, you know, intertidal and subtidal populations and do some comparisons. Um, but I guess it'd be probably most interesting to do it in something like whelks since they're direct development.